We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 3. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 3. Um, as we uh, prepare our hearts, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, I am so thankful for your word and so grateful that you've given us an opportunity to have your word, to learn your word, and to live your word. And so my prayer this morning is as we take the time to understand a little bit more of who you are, that we would conform ourselves into your image by the power of your spirit. So spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Thank you for these men who have raised up holy hands. And as we desire to be spiritual men, we're here this morning hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's men said, Amen, amen. There's a reason that you came here this morning, and it's to grow. You, well, you may have, like Zach, grown in your stomach with 10 pieces of bacon. Can't believe Rob called him out. You really don't have bacon in your pocket, though, right? <laughs> but you've also come here to grow, not just physically, but you've come here to grow spiritually. So when we sing a song like The Great I Am, and you kind of lose your spirit in the moment, and you lift up a holy hand, and all of a sudden, all of your issues, all of your problems, everything that you brought here this morning gets a little bit smaller because you realize how great and how big God is. Amen. Amen. Well, God has a desire for you. And the desire is that each one of us are conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The desire is that each one of us grow spiritually. Uh, you guys know I've got nine kids. And when they were babies, my hope was not that they would throw temper tantrums when they were 30 years old, like they used to throw when they were two years old. Uh, I'll never forget my son, when we lived in the Bahamas, uh, many of you know I'm Bahamian from the Bahamas. We actually went back and lived there for five years. And my son had done something that I said, son, this is going to be cause for discipline in your life. He said to me, dad, if you spank me, I'm going to run to a camera. Okay? So this was my son. He's like seven years old, telling me this. And I go, bub, um, you're in the wrong country. We have moved to the Bahamas. There are no cameras here, number one. And number two, nobody's coming for you. As we turn aisle seven into aisle eight, there is this Bahamian woman. She has literally taken her shoe off and she is whooping her child in aisle eight. I mean, she's just boom. And let me tell you something about Bahamian women. As long as they are talking, they are still beaten, okay? And if they run out of words, it goes to this. Don't you ever, 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 and they'll say ever for an eternity till they are worn out. So my son comes around into aisle eight and sees this woman. <laughs> I say to him, would you like me to leave you with her? She looks at me and she says, give him to me, boy, I'll kill him. <laughs> And he looked at me, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The truth is he got disciplined. I didn't beat him in aisle eight, but he did get disciplined. I didn't leave him with her, but the goal of it was I want him to be a responsible 30-year-old and not do what he did when he was seven and eight years old. Well, God's a parent. When Jesus introduced us to him, he said, when you pray to him, say, our father. He's a parent. And so the truth of God is that he has a desire that each one of us grow. He doesn't want to leave us where we're at, though he loves us and accepts us where we're at. He is pushing us towards being conformed into the image of his son. Do you know that Pastor Jeff is not the standard? Pastor Pat is not the standard. Pastor Zach is not the standard. Lester is not the standard. Jesus is our standard. Amen. 
And unfortunately, as men, sometimes we compare ourselves to other men. But the truth of the matter is, the only person that we need to compare ourselves to and look at the standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want everyone to say, Jesus. Jesus. Note, I didn't have you say Chet. I didn't call out a famous pastor and say, let's say his name so that we can become like him. No, the name that we're calling out is the name of Jesus because every single one of us are to be conformed into his image. And what God does in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and chapter 3, he gives us a great example of a man who spiritually grew up. He gives us a great example of a spiritual growth plan for our lives through the prophet Samuel. Now, you know his story. His wife, uh, Elkanah, his wife, could not have children. She pleaded to the Lord there in the temple, and Eli, so corrupt, she, he, he comes into this woman, Hannah, she's there praying, and she's just, Lord Jesus, I just, or God, I just pray that you would give me a child. Eli comes walking into the scene and goes, what, are you drunk? When you see a woman crying and praying in church, you don't walk up to her and go, are you drunk? I mean, something's wrong with you, Eli, if you think that a woman who's crying in church has, is, has been drinking. And he was corrupt. And his ministry was about to come to an end. Because when he grew up spiritually, he grew away from God instead of growing towards God. And so Hannah prays and God gives her a son. But when she receives the son, she gives her son back to God. Now I know you might be thinking today, what did she, she just dropped her kid off at the church and left him there? Yes. And Eli raised this child. And Eli allowed this child to assist him there in the temple. This was a profound act of a mom who loved her son but made a commitment to God that her child was going to be raised in the temple. Well, if you take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, we're just going to skirt through chapter 2. The Bible says, Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered, circle this word, to the Lord before Eli the priest. If you take a look down at verse 18, once again we see Samuel in comparison to the wicked sons of Eli, but Samuel, verse 18, ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. And I emphasize those two words, to, and now I'll emphasize the word before in verse 18, because what we see in Samuel is something powerful. He's ministering to the Lord. That's what we just did. You lifted up holy hands. You proclaimed Jesus as Lord. You said in worship that he's the great I am. Samuel was worshiping to, he was worshiping. He was ministering to the Lord. That's what you did here on Saturday morning. And I commend you for those holy hands. But in verse 18, he was ministering before the Lord. So we're sitting down at the breakfast table. Jeff the servant, he grabs, Pastor Jeff, he grabs my plate and he goes and he says, I'll take it. Now I'm, I'll take it. And he goes, no, I'll take it. As we're arguing over who takes the plate, some incredible servant comes around the two of us, grabs the plates and goes, no, I'll take it. (laughs) And it's like we're fighting to serve. Who's going to serve who? So here is Samuel, he's ministering to the Lord in worship, but he's ministering before the Lord as he serves. In verse 26 of the same chapter, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and men. God's grace is on this guy. He's serving, he's worshiping, And he's growing in the Lord, but not only in the Lord. Other people look in his life and it's like, have you heard about the Samuel guy? Have you seen him in the temple? Do you see the way he serves? Do you see the way that he worships? Man, let me tell you something. I'm sitting right here. One of the songs goes up, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Joe stands up in worship. It inspires me as I see him worshiping, and I stand up. 
he spurs me to love and good works. And that's what was going on in Israel. Samuel is living a faithful life, and he's living a faithful life in the midst of so much corruption, and people are noticing the difference. Can I tell you something about John the Baptist? You never went down to the wilderness and said, now where is John? I mean, John had a beard down to here. He wore a little Tarzan suit, and he was saying to people as they came up, repent, kingdom of God is near. You never wondered if John was a believer. I wonder if I go to your work, do pe and I would just say, where are the believers? Would people go, oh, let me introduce you. Is there absolutely no doubt at your workplace that you are a believer? You'd never doubt where John the Baptist was. I wonder if I walked into your place of work, would people see? And are you making the kind of impact that Samuel was making as Israel was noticing something's different about him? He's not like Eli, and he's definitely not like Eli's sons. There's something. God's favor is on him. Yet with his worship, and yet with his service, while they are a part of our spiritual growth, they can't be the only part of our spiritual growth. We can't just worship on Saturday morning. We can't just fight over a plate to serve on Saturday morning. No, no, no. There's something more to our spiritual growth. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 3 as we begin to see a little bit more of how God grows us up spiritually. Now the boy Samuel. Now this word boy in the Hebrew is more young man. This young man Samuel, so he's growing, ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now listen to this. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Let it never be said of Calvary Chapel, South Bay, that the word of God has, been, has stopped preaching here. I don't care what the, 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 the woke church is doing, what the progressive church is doing. What's important is that we preach the word of God. That the word of God, the revelation of God is communicated. We've got to be careful with every wind and wave of doctrine and stick to the word of God. How sad it is that there was no widespread word of God being spoken of in Israel. What a slap in the spiritual face of Eli, who was the spiritual leader, that it's written of him that he stopped preaching the word. The Bible goes on to say, and it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow so dim he couldn't see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down. Now, I've emphasized a couple of words. It is dark and dismal, and the writer of 1 Samuel is letting us know. The light's going out. Eli was almost blind. The lamp is going out. Samuel's lying down. I mean, this was a dark and dismal Israel that he's trying to describe for us. It's like Genesis chapter 1, you remember? The earth was void and without form. And then what happened? And God said... And when God started speaking, creation started forming. And when God said, let there be light, there was light. And when God stopped speaking, do you know what happened? And it was night. And God, the next morning, he woke up and God said. And then day three, and God said. And every time God spoke, something was forming on the world. But every time God stopped speaking, and it was night. Gentlemen, when we stop God from speaking into our life, we are entering into the night of our spiritual formation. We are entering into a backsliding state. 
We have got to be men that are allowing God to speak into our lives by being men of the word of God. You see, while serving and worshiping are a part of our spiritual growth, we have got to let God be speaking into our life so that he can form in us the image of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And take a look what happens there in chapter 3. I'll pick it up. Samuel's lying down that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. Now, here's the saddest verse in the Bible. So Samuel ran to Eli. Samuel, you've been given to the temple. Like, you're a busy servant. You're a worshiper. People are looking at you going, wow, you're different. You're not like them. You would think that when God spoke to to Samuel... He would go, yes, Lord? But is it possible that Samuel was so busy worshiping and serving that he really didn't have a relationship yet with God? Was he so busy about doing the work of God that he neglected his relationship with God? But God knew what would cause that relationship to grow. Yes, Samuel, you're worshiping. Yes, Samuel, you're serving. But I need to build a relation with you by speaking into your life. And so I need to get your attention because spiritual growth happens when God is speaking into your life. So he said, Samuel, that's all he said. And he ran to Eli. He didn't recognize God's voice. Do you remember when Jesus spoke to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3? Do you remember what he said to the church in uh, Ephesus, the first church? I love your works. You're busy. You're doing this. You're doing this. I love all that you're doing. I love how you're serving. But I got one thing we got to talk about. Get back to your first love. I want you to serve. I want you to worship but I want to be in relationship with you. And the way that I'm in relationship with my wife, I talk to her. She talks to me. We have communication. We've got connection. And when we get so busy about serving and worshiping and we neglect the communication and the connection, our relationship is going to wane with God. And so God gets Samuel attention in the midst of the darkness of Israel, because he wanted Samuel to grow. Now, do you remember creation? What happened when God said, let there be light? Okay. What happened when God said, hey, tree, come up? What happened? What happened when God took the dust and said, be a man? What happened? There was a... (laughs) Great answer. Here we are. The truth is when God speaks into our life, something happens. The word of God will not return void. It's going to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And we're going to see that in Samuel's life. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're going to pick it up there in verse 19. And we're going to see five things, and quickly quickly we're going to walk through them. I want you to see what happened to Samuel when God started speaking to his life. I'm going to pick it up there in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 19. So Samuel grew. That word is an interesting word. It actually means in Hebrew, he became great. I want you to write this down, number one, desire spiritual greatness in your life. Desire spiritual greatness. You see, the evidence of God speaking into Samuel's life was that he became great. Now, I don't want you to seek greatness like James and John sought greatness. You see, what they did was they went to Jesus and they said, hey, listen, we'd like to sit at the right and the left. Then it didn't work for them. They sent mom. They go, mom, it didn't work for us. He gave us this answer. (laughs) you got to go deal with this. Mom was feeding Jesus. So the best way to, to, to a man is through his stomach. So they said, listen, why don't you go? Mom goes in on the scene and says, listen, my sons would like to sit at the right and the left. He gave the same answer. Gentlemen, 
James and John's plight is very similar to all of us. If we're honest for just a moment, when we think about greatness, we think about power. We think about prestige. We think about our prominence. We think about our profit. Because we look at the world and people with money, they're great. People with fame and popularity, they're great. Now, don't ask about their character, nor their conduct, or their six previous wives. But they got money. They got fame. They must be great. And the way that the world sees great, let me give you an example. When Samuel came on the scene to anoint David, Zach said it the other day, David wasn't even in the lineup. He wasn't even there. He goes, well, I got one other son. And God says to Samuel, man looks at the outward, but I look at the inward. So we've got to ask ourselves a question. What do we see as great? Because when I say desire spiritual greatness, we've got to move from a James and John mentality, and we've got to get into a Jesus mentality. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9. Let me show you this. Keep your finger there in 1 Samuel 3. Go with me to Mark 9. Mark chapter 9, I'm going to pick it up in verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they disputed among themselves who would be greatest. Now remember, James and John had gone, and they wanted to be the greatest, so this caused quite a stir amongst the disciples. And he sat down, he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone desires to be first, if anyone desires to be great, he shall be last of all and servant of all. See, the reason why God was forming in Samuel a servant is because a servant is great in the kingdom of God. And each one of us are trying to climb a ladder when in the church we should be trying to climb down. You see, Jesus looks at servanthood as greatness. He looks at the slave of all as greatness. He sees the person fighting over the plate uh, uh, and I, I, don't, I wish I knew your name who came and took the plate from me and Jeff because I don't even know his name. That's a servant, someone that is just serving. They don't need to be in the spotlight. They don't need to be in the front. And they're probably embarrassed right now because they know who they are that I'm actually calling them out because someone might have seen them. No, a servant, I remember at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, I served there for 27 years. And I'll never forget, we had this one guy who collected the Bibles as long as the senior pastor was watching. As soon as the senior pastor stopped watching, he put the Bibles that were in his pack, okay, in his hand, he would put them on the seat exactly where he was, and he'd walk away. And I knew every Sunday night, I would have to go to that chair and pick up those Bibles because he would leave them there as soon as the senior pastor would walk away. Until one Sunday night. He's picking up those Bibles, and he's watching the senior pastor, making sure, you know, pastor can see him picking up these Bibles, Pastor walks out the door, forgot his Bible, came back. Well, the guy had already put the Bibles down in the seat. As soon as the senior pastor came back in the room, you know what he did? Ran to the seat, picked up the Bibles, and started picking them up again. I I couldn't help it myself. I stopped him that Sunday. I said, dude, we got to talk. Do you see what you just did? Do you know you're not serving this man? You're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You see, the reason why God was forming in Samuel a servant is because Jesus looks at him and goes, that's great. But I want you to see something else in Mark chapter 9. Take a look at what else Jesus sees as greatness. Then he took a little child, set him in the midst of them. Now stop there. Let's pick up the story in Matthew 18. Go to Matthew 18. We're going to pick up the story where Jesus picks up this child. Matthew chapter 18, as we link the chronology of these stories together. At that time, verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, 
unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what it's like speaking in front of a bunch of men? You, you know what I'm about to do. Whenever I teach at church, my voice is a little higher pitched. But as soon as I come to a men's conference or I'm going to teach at a men's breakfast, well, good morning. <laughs> Something happens. Your chest comes out. You know, it's like you want to do a couple of curls before you show up. I mean, it's like you, you, you got to be a man. Jesus, what are you talking about? You got to become like a little child. This don't make no sense. He says, you got to become like a little child. The disciples are going, <coughs> excuse me? Because the disciples shooed away the children only a couple of chapters ago. Got to become like a child? Take a look if we, as we go on. Verse 4, therefore, whoever, circle this word in your Bible, humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. My children are grown, but we had a, a family dinner a couple nights ago, and we were talking about when they were smaller. My daughter, who's now 19, wishes she was 25. Um, she actually, on her birthday, her 19th birthday, she woke up and she goes, I'm just so disappointed. And I said, why? She goes, I'm not even 20 yet. I go, sweetie, you're 19. Like, you're so close. I know, but it's not 20. Relax. Wait till you're 50. You want to be 20. You know, uh, you want to be 19. So we were talking about her childhood. And the one thing that I used to love that she would do, and she still does it to this day, whenever I would walk into the room and she was trying to accomplish something, she would just turn and lift her hands. And the lifting of the hands was, I need you now. I, need, I, I really need you. And that was her way to get my attention. Now, she did some other things that we talked about when she was a child. I've never really spanked this particular child or disciplined this child because she really didn't need to. And when the first time I went to go discipline her, she was three years old. And I said to her, Selah, I do not like what you did. She said to me, I do not like your tone right now. <laughs> And I said to her, she goes, you are hurting. And I said to her, I don't care if you like my tone or not. What you did was wrong. She goes, do you know that you are hurting my feelings right now? <laughs> Sorry, gentlemen, I laughed so hard. I couldn't recover. I could not believe. And I've never disciplined her. She's been like the perfect child ever since. So she didn't even need to be disciplined at that point. Now we've corrected and we've moved her in a direction. But she's just been the one child that could captivate my heart. But the truth is about her, any time she needed help, she was humble. It's the difference between my wife breaking down on the side of the road. I'll lift the hood. I have no idea what I'm looking at. It is a black hole, as far as I'm concerned. And now they put red and some blue in it. It's like, I have no idea. I'm not mechanical at all. My wife, when she breaks down on the road, Jesus, I need help now. I don't know what it is about men that we think we can always do it on our own. What is, let me ask you a question. They talk about a self-made man, right? What did you make about yourself this morning? Like, did you keep your heart pumping through the night? What did you do through the night to keep yourself alive? What is it about guys that we cannot humble ourselves when we know there's a blessing of humility, that it's in humility that God exalts us? Desire spiritual greatness. Number two, I want you to see something. Go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, I want you to see Samuel grew. He became great. But look at this. And the Lord was with him. Number two, if you're writing it down, I want you to write this, purpose to please God. You want to grow spiritually? You want the Lord on your side? The Lord was with him. There was something about the ministry of Samuel that it's written of him, the Lord was with him. Now, the Bible says God left Eli. God left Eli's sons. There was something different about Samuel and his ministry. And what's noted of him is a matter of fact, the Lord was with him. God was blessing his life. God was blessing his ministry. The favor of God was on him. And let me tell you the difference between Eli, who God forsook, and Samuel, who God was with. 
Eli lived a life of compromise. Samuel lived a life of conviction. You see, the people would bring in their meat, and the meat would have to be boiled. But the boys didn't like boiled meat. They liked it barbecue. So when the meat would come, they would send a servant, go get the, the thigh. I want the thigh today. And the worshiper would go, you can't have it yet because we got to boil it. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> the boys want it. You better give it to them. And then when the women would come and they would come to worship, the boys would go, oh, what's up, babe? <laughs> You're kind of cute. And they would take the beautiful women and do things in the back corner they should not have been doing. Two of the three deadly sins, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. They saw the meat, they wanted it. They saw the women, lust of the flesh, and they wanted them. They lived a life of compromise. And Eli went to the boys one day and he said to the boys, hey boys, the thing that you're doing is not really good. You shouldn't be doing this. But he doesn't discipline them. He doesn't correct them. In fact, he enjoys from them. He's eating the meat that they're stealing from the worshipers. We know this because when he's 99 years old, hears that his boys die, he's so overweight from eating the best of the best, he goes, oh my goodness, and his head is so large, it snaps his neck. Eli, you chose a life of compromise, and God forsook your ministry. Samuel, you chose a life of conviction. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to pick it up in verse 9. Paul gives a statement. He says this. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to the Lord. What was the point? Number two, purpose to please God. Gentlemen, let me say, tell you, go down with me if you would to verse 17. He describes, verse 16, he describes how we can purpose Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, I don't want to even talk about the flesh. I don't want to deal with the flesh. I don't want to even, I don't want to know you as a fleshly person. I don't want to know you as angry. I don't want to know you as jealous. I don't want to know you as greedy. I don't want to know you as a slanderer. I don't want to know you as a lust-filled person. We're not going to regard anyone according to the flesh. Look what else he says. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Key verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. In other words, if you call yourself a Christian, here's the fruit. He is, matter of fact, a new creation. And now he defines it. Old things have passed away. Now look at this word, behold, all, not some, all things have become new. Gentlemen, when we make it our aim, when we purpose to please God, there is nothing in our life, nothing in our life that we settle with that does not look like Jesus. And if there's anything that God brings to our attention that doesn't look like Jesus, we're doing what Jesus said. We're plucking out that eye. We're cutting off that arm. We are radically amputating it out of our life because our aim is to please God, not our flesh. So we've got to be careful with our phones at night. We gotta be careful the way that we speak to our wives and our children. We've gotta be careful with how we serve and worship God, not just for people to see us, but who we are when no one's watching us. We've gotta make it our aim to please God, just like Samuel.
Number three, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 3, let's take a look. He says in verse 19, so Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Number three, pay attention to what you say. Pay attention to what you say. Everything that Samuel said was right. He was a true prophet. Everything he prophesied came to pass. Everything he said was right. If he told you that your life was heading down a wrong path, listen to Samuel because what he's telling you is true. I've had 450 Patmos students. And it amazes me in our school of discipleship, 450 students, I will speak to someone and I will say to them, listen, you need to change this in your life. Who do you think you are? I got a phone call last week. Hey, Pastor Chet. Actually, it wasn't last week. It was last month. Everything you said was right. I wish I would have listened. Pay attention to what you say. Jesus did. In John chapter 5, he said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. Can you say that? John 12, he says this, I only say what the Father tells me to say. Do I do that? I'm sure yesterday I said some things the Father would not say. Amen? Amen. Uh, Come on, you guys, help me out. Don't let me be the only one here. I mean, I got a couple couple guys that go, yeah, me too. You know? Did anyone say anything yesterday they're pretty sure the Father would not have said? Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. At least I know there's some sinners in the crowd. I'm not. <laughs> you don't have to agree too much. All right, now listen. Paul gave an exhortation. I'm going to read it for you. You don't need to turn there. It's in Colossians if you're taking note. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Listen to the exhortation he gave. Let your speech always, not sometimes, always be with grace. And then he says this. Seasoned with salt, listen carefully, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. You know what Paul's saying? Would you think before you talk? Because when your wife comes at you and you go back at her, let me tell you, that is not, be careful. (laughs) When your wife comes at you and you want to go back at her, be careful what you ought to say and what you want to say. When you come home and your son has not mowed the lawn and he's sleeping in his bed, be careful what you want to say and what you ought to say. And when you get that hammer and it hits your thumb, be careful with what you ought to say and what you want to say. Because I want to remind you something. Out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. Pay attention to what you say. You might discover where your heart's at. Pay attention how you talk to your wife. You might discover where your heart's at. Pay attention how you talk about your boss or your employees. You might discover where your heart's at. Pay attention to what we say. And if you don't have something great to say, follow the advice of Solomon. He said in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, when you go before God, let your words be few. Number three, pay attention to what you say. 1 Samuel chapter 3, I'm going to go back. We're going to look at number four. Take a look as we read on. And all of Israel, verse 20, all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. They knew it. Number four, Build your testimony. Do you know that the name Lo means something to me? It's my last name, Chet Lo. My dad used to look at me when I was a kid and he used to say this. That last name you hold, he's Bahamian, so I'll do a little Bahamian accent. Sorry if it came out. That last name you hold, it belongs to me. 
and it belongs to your great grandfather and your grandfather and your great grandfather. They represented it well. You better do the same. When my children went out, I never used to say be good. I used to say set an example. That name belongs to me. Do you know that your name belongs to God? When he calls you his son, you're his ambassador. He's not yours. And that name has represented for an eternity righteousness and goodness. Samuel was known from Dan to Beersheba. He built his testimony. And when people say your name, what do they think? Oh, he's a funny guy. Oh, don't work with him. He'll cheat you. Well, you might not want to call him. He really doesn't work that hard. When people say your name, now let me ask you, when your wife says your name, does she say it, Chet or Chet? <laughs> when your children say dad, do they go dad or oh, dad? What does your name mean to the people closest around you? Because as you're building your testimony, what do they know you from Dan to Beersheba, from the south to the north? What are you known for? Build your testimony today. Let me tell you how. Paul was on the road to Damascus, you remember? He was on his way to kill some people. He had just seen this death of, Sto of Stephen. He's been sent by the el elders to go and do some damage in Damascus. Guess what Jesus does? Surprise. I mean, just imagine the moment, right? Uh, um, Saul, Saul, uh, why are you kicking against the goats? In other words, I've been trying to get your attention a long time. And I'm sure some believer somewhere when Paul, when Paul was beating them was witnessing to Paul. I'm sure that's what was happening. Some loving Christian was reaching out to Paul when they were getting beat by him. And Jesus says, listen, I've been trying to get your attention a long time. Why are you kicking against the goads? Why do you persecute me? You know the next thing Paul says? Two questions. And they're the greatest questions for us to build our testimony. The first was this. Who are you, Lord? I want to know who you are. The second question was this. What do you want me to do, Lord? I don't want to just know you. I want to follow you. And if you make that your life's pursuit to ask those two questions, I want to know you and I want to follow you, you will build your testimony like Samuel. Build your testimony. What is your name known for? That's number four. Finally, take a look. 1 Samuel chapter 3, number 5. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, verse 21. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Number five, grow spiritually. Be faithful. Be faithful with what God gives you. Now, I, know, I want to remind you where we started. When Eli was the high priest, do you remember the words? Dark. His eyes were dim. The lamp was going out. Do you remember the words? I mean, it was just dark and it was dismal because he was a man of compromise. He was not a man of conviction. And the Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, there was no revelation. He'd stopped preaching the word. And now all of a sudden, we see a faithful man. We see a man who's a prophet. He knows he's called to be a prophet, and he's going to do his job well. And he's not going to compromise. He is a man of conviction. And now all of a sudden, where there was no widespread revelation, there's revival. Everyone in Israel heard the word of Samuel, and Samuel was preaching the word of God. He was faithful. You know what Jesus said? It's John chapter 17, verse 4. He said this. I have glorified you on earth. I did what you asked me to do. Do you know when you get to heaven, Jesus told a story. A servant passes away and he gets to heaven and Jesus meets him there and says, well done, good and Say it again. 
Okay, I'm going to try. Well done, good and Do you notice he doesn't say fruitful? Do you notice he gave one to one servant, five to one servant, ten to another? Do you notice that he doesn't compare apples to apples or oranges to oranges? He doesn't say, well, you know, okay, you only you had ten, you had five, all right, you know, you were really fruitful. No, he says, well done, good and faithful. You were responsible with what I gave you to do. Some of you are dads. Are you responsible with what he gave you to do? Some of you are husbands. Are you responsible with what he gave you to do? Some of you are employers. Some of you are employees. Are you being responsible with what he gave you to do? Some of you have 10,000 in the bank. Some of you got, well, I think I'll make it to next week. Are you being responsible with what he gave you? You see, we can come up with every excuse in the book of why we can be irresponsible. But I tell my children all the time, you practice irresponsibility, you will be irresponsible. So go back in your room, you're responsible to make that bed. And I'm teaching you to make that bed in that simple thing so that when you go out into your world, you'll be responsible with the little things. It has nothing to do with that bed. It has everything to do with me forming in you to be responsible with what I've given you to do. I am a pastor. I'm a shepherd. I'm a preacher and I'm a teacher. I am to be responsible with what God's given me to do. Don't compare yourself to me because you might be an administrator. You might be a leader. You might be a missionary. You might be a helper. You might have the gift of mercy. Your responsibility is to be responsible like Samuel with what he gave you to do so that when he sees you, he doesn't say, well done, good and fruitful. He says, well done, good and faithful. And you like Jesus and you like Paul could say at the end of your days, I fought my fight. I ran my race. I know not all of us are called to be prophets like Samuel, but we're all called to be faithful just like him. So gentlemen, listen carefully. Number one, Samuel shows us desire spiritual greatness, humility, and servanthood. Number two, purpose to please God. Make it your aim in life. Do you remember what Jesus said? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Grow them up by giving them the word and let them put the word into action in their life. Make it your aim to know his word. Number three, pay attention to what you say. You might find out where your heart is. And you might discover what you want to say and what you ought to say. Number four, build your testimony. Find out to know Jesus and to follow Jesus. And finally, number five, be faithful with what he's given you to do. And you're going to soar in your spirit just like Samuel. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to get on your knees. If you're not understood, but if you are, you can take a knee. As men, we're going to go before our God. Father, I have to believe those, these men on a Saturday morning who have come to hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're here because they want to spiritually grow. And we look at a man like Samuel and we're amazed that from the time he was young 
till his dying day, he served you faithfully. And he was known as a great man of God. And our desire is that our testimony would be of you. Gentlemen, as we just take a moment to kneel before the Lord, if you need to work on your testimony, the best day to change it is today. If you've not been faithful with what's been given to you, the best day to change it is today. If you've been seeking power and prominence, prestige and profit, and now you realize greatness is found in humility and service, the best day to change is today. Just take your moment with the Lord. If today you realize, I want to be a man like Samuel. I want to be a great man of God. And that's your conviction for the first time today. We just lift up your hand. No one's looking. I just want to pray for you. Yeah. And so our Father with humble hands lifted high. Would you pour out on us your spirit that our testimony would be like Samuel, that we became great in the kingdom of heaven, not of this world. Fill us, Lord, overflow us. Let your spirit rain down upon us Our hands are lifted in humility because today our testimony changes. Today our life is made new. Today old things have passed and all have become new. Fight our battles for us and with us and give us the strength to be like Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, would you stand with me? I'm 50 now. So when I stand up, my body's making noises. (laughs) It used to be a solo, now it's an ensemble. Do you know why it's an honor to be with you? Because you're here. You want to be like Jesus. And I commend your faith. And now when you leave this place of peace and go into your world of chaos, remember the commitment you made today. And when you feel weak, that's when you go, Lord, I am weak. I need your spirit now. And you know what he does? He honors that prayer. And when you want to say something else, but you know what you ought to say, he speaks through you. For me, sometimes he just shuts me up. And my prayer for you is that when you go out into that world, you won't forget the commitment you made today. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name for every man in this room. I pray that our commitment would be to you 
and that our life's pursuit would be to be able to say like Jesus at the end of our days, we glorified you on earth. We did what you asked us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.